Hey, good morning, Grace Baptist Church. So thankful to be with you uh, again on this Thursday morning. I'm coming to you from Holden Beach, North Carolina. You can see the shrimp boats in the background, those lights there on the ocean. So thankful for this time we've had with our family over the past week and uh, looking forward to another couple of days uh, of being with the family and relaxation before we head back uh, to Hamtramck. So as we look at God's word this morning, uh, Jesus is gonna be on trial. There's gonna be injustice perpetrated. So let's uh, see what God's word has for us this morning and how we handle injustice in this world. Father, we thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you for your uh, great love um, you display through life Lord, that you are gonna give us today, the opportunity to serve you, to live for your glory. Lord, help us not to squander uh, what you're giving us today. And Lord, as we approach this day, we wanna do it according to your word. And so please help us now as we come in contact with your word that we would be transformed so that we might live like Jesus Christ throughout this day. In his name we pray. Amen. So this morning as we look at this passage in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 26, verses 57 through 68, uh, we're going to see that uh, there's a horrible injustice perpetrated against Jesus Christ. Uh, he stands in trial, on trial before the Sanhedrin. There's this kangaroo court. Uh, there is this uh, mocking of justice, if you will, as Jesus is put on trial before the Sanhedrin. And what I want you to get this morning, as, as I put out there before you, we went through this in Mark's gospel, is that God works through injustice for the good of his children. God works through injustice for the good of his children. So let's look at the text. And the first thing we're gonna see as we look at the text is an earthly court. The Sanhedrin comes together in the middle of the night. Jesus has been arrested in the garden and the Sanhedrin throws together a court and it goes against what God's law says. These Pharisees, who are those who are supposedly upholding the law of God, are breaking the law of God by bringing together this court to put Jesus on trial. And so we see this earthly court beginning there in verse 7, 57, I'm sorry. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and he sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests in the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. And so there we have this picture of this earthly court where Jesus is uh, falsely accused. Um, the, the, tri the, 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 the accusation that was brought up against Jesus was that he said he was going to destroy the temple. And the closest he came to saying anything like that was in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus, as he's leaving the temple, he says, look, not one stone's going to be left standing here. And he's referring to what was going to happen. He's making a prophecy about what was going to happen in AD 70 when the Romans would come in and destroy the temple. And Jesus wasn't saying that he was going to do it, but he was just saying, look, this temple is not going to be standing uh, for very long. So anyway, these false accusations were brought against Jesus in this kangaroo court there in front of the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night with Peter looking on. Well, then we see a heavenly court. Jesus is going to respond and he's going to refer to a heavenly court which will take place. The high priest said to Jesus, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Verse 64, you have said so. In Mark's gospel it's a little more powerful. Mark says, Jesus' response is, I am. Jesus goes on, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus' response is referring to Daniel chapter 7. We'll look at that in a minute, but it's about the return of Jesus Christ when he will judge the earth justly. And so Jesus' response is something that will happen in the future, but not right at that moment. Well, then we see an earthly injustice there in verse 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy, right? They knew exactly what Jesus was referring to there when he said the Son of Man is going to come on clouds. Jesus was referring to Daniel 7. They knew that, and they knew that Jesus was calling himself the Messiah. He was calling himself God. 
Verse 65, Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and they struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? And so there we see the closing of this kangaroo court in the Sanhedrin there in Matthew's Gospel. We see the greatest injustice ever perpetrated before our eyes. But, you know, one day there is going to be heavenly justice, right? We saw that earthly justice, the earthly injustice, I should say. But one day there's going to be heavenly justice. And, and we really, when Jesus was on the cross, heavenly justice began, right? When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the irony there was, uh, as, as Satan and the devil and his demons uh, were laughing at Jesus, they believed that they were killing him, really, they were putting themselves to death. To death. They were putting themselves on trial. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, as the sins of humanity were placed on him, and those sins were being dealt with once and for all, Satan thought he had won victory over Jesus. They, Satan thought that he was able to get away with that injustice. No, justice was being perpetrated. Justice was being carried out on that cross. As God dealt with sin justly, but in doing so, he dealt with devil and his demons. So what can we learn from this text this morning as we look at Jesus being on trial? Well, I think the first thing we can look at is that all humans, all humans long for justice, right? As we read about Jesus being placed on trial here, we see an injustice being perpetrated. And all of us within us, uh, we have this desire for justice. Every single human being on the face of the earth has a desire to see justice carried out. Now, why is that the case? Why is that that throughout all cultures, all around the world, every person has a sense of justice. And that's because we're all created in the image of God and God is a just God. And God has instilled within each person a desire to see right done, to see justice accomplished. We all long for justice because we're all created in the image of God. Secondly, we live in a sin-cursed world that rejects the just words of their just creator. And consequently, there will always be just injustice on the earth, right? As, human, as humanity in our sinfulness, we have rejected God, the just judge. We have rejected his justice. And as long as we do that, there will be injustice in the world, right? Justice doesn't exist in a vacuum. Justice is a response to an infraction of a standard, the law, right? God has given us his law and his word. And, and the way that we carry out that word determines how justice is going to proceed. If we throw out the word of God, we throw out any sense of true, real justice. And so as long as humanity rejects the word of God in sin, there will be injustice in the world. That's just the way it's going to be. But we know, as Christians, that justice will prevail. God's word tells us that justice will prevail. God's word tells us that one day... Jesus Christ is going to return. Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to judge the earth justly according to the word of God. And justice will prevail, right? When, when Jesus refers to Daniel chapter 7 in this text, when he says the Son of Man is going to come in the cloud with his angels, when he refers to that text, he's referring to a time when he would return and judge the earth justly and set up his kingdom, and it will be a kingdom of justice. Right? So Daniel chapter 7, and the context of Daniel chapter 7 is this. Daniel is getting a vision of these kingdoms, these great kingdoms that are going to come on the face of the earth. Right? There's this vision of this, this bear. There's a vision of a lion. There's a vision of a leopard. There's a vision of this, this uh, fierce animal with iron teeth, referring to the Roman Empire. And all these kingdoms, powerful as they were, they came and they went. But there will come an everlasting kingdom. And that kingdom is mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Jesus Christ is going to return to judge the earth, and he will judge it justly, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And all humanity longs for that. 
As Christians, we especially long for that because we, we read the word of God and we know that Jesus Christ is going to return. Isaiah talks about the type of kingdom that Jesus is going to have. In verse 7 of chapter 9 of Isaiah, as Isaiah prophesies the coming Messiah, he says this, Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David, David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So the, the kingdom of Jesus Christ that will come will be a king of righteousness, a king of justice from that time on and forevermore. Well, that's a kingdom to come. That will happen one day when Christ returns. So how do we respond in the meantime to injustice? Certainly this past summer has been a summer of uh, injustice, either real or perceived. Uh, it's, it's been a very difficult summer for our country. And so how do we respond to injustice as we see it as a nation and as we see it personally? How do we respond to justice in the meantime as we await the return of Jesus Christ? Well, listen, what I'm about to say, I don't want you to misconstrue it, right? As Christians, we're not supposed to be doormats. We don't just lay down. We don't roll over and let people walk over us, right? As Christians, as we see injustice, we need to act according to the word of God and respond as Christ would respond and address injustice as we see it. But no matter what we do, because we function in an unjust system, as long as we are on this earth and Christ has not returned, there will be injustice. But Christians should respond to it. But we need to respond rightly, right? We don't lash out when we see injustice, right? Jesus Christ gives us a great example here in this passage. In Matthew 26, when Jesus is unjustly charged, how does he respond in the Sanhedrin? Let's look at verse 61 of chapter 26. Finally, two men came forward and declared, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. I've already said that was a false accusation. Go back to Matthew 24. And then in verse 62 here, Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? And how did Jesus respond? Jesus remained silent. How do you want to respond when you're treated unjustly? I know how I want to respond. I want to lash out. I want to say what I think. I want to be aggressive towards the person who is carrying out an injustice against me. But you know, as Christians, we have to understand that and this is important. Every single injustice perpetrated against us, if we're a child of God, is a part of the plan of God. Injustice doesn't stay, escape God's sovereign control over our lives. So if, if we're being mistreated, if we're being treated unjustly, as Christians, as God's children, that's a part of our Father's all-wise plan for us. We have to understand that God is working through injustice for our good because He promises that in His Word. That He's causing all things to work together for good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. So, so injustice is a part of God's plan for His children in this part of our existence, in this sin-cursed world. And so we have to respond rightly. We have to respond as our Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, in his epistle, says this about Jesus Christ's response. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Right? The son, as he was, as he was being mistreated, as he was being beaten, as he was being mocked, as he was being scorned, as he was being crucified on a cross, as he was being unjustly treated, understood that this was a part of the Father's greater plan and that he had to respond as the Father had commanded him to respond in faith, trusting in the plan of the Father. Well, lastly, um, as we look at this text, God worked through the greatest injustice ever perpetrated, the execution of Jesus Christ on the cross, to accomplish the greatest good for his children. God was working through the death of Jesus Christ, the greatest uh, injustice ever perpetrated for our good, right? We see in the cross of Jesus Christ that that injustice, that that unjust crucifixion was ordained by God. It was a part of his eternal plan. Acts 2.23 says this, Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. You know, as Jesus Christ was being crucified, he wasn't a victim. He was an active victor over sin and death as a part of God's plan. God, yes, he used sinful men to carry that out, okay? 
but that was a part of God's plan. And Jesus responded according to the will of the Father in submission to the will as he, as he underwent that injustice. So we see God ordained the injustice and God worked through the injustice, right? 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, right? The injustice that Christ suffered as he was hanging on the cross was for our greater good. It was to bring us back to God, to bring us into a right relationship with God. So the cross is the example. God uses injustice in this world for the good of his children. So as you, as you live for God, as you live for Christ and you suffer injustice, understand that it's not out of God's sovereign control. God is working through that for your good, for, for your good and for his glory. And we have to embrace that. It's not easy, is it? It sounds, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about it now, but it's hard when you're going through. We have to trust in God who judges justly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, again for your word. We thank you for the truths contained therein. Father, as we suffer injustice, help us, Father, to understand that it's a part of your great plan for us, that we have to respond correctly according to your word, according to our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, Grace, I look forward to being back with you on Sunday. I'll be there, be there Sunday to worship with you. Sam is going to be bringing the word on Sunday morning, so looking forward to that as well. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye, Grace.